students. Our students, this one, most of them are going to graduate in May. Some of them they will live one more year. Uh, this is uh, the first uh, seminar that we are going to offer during the whole year until May, as, uh, as I have been telling you in my class. Uh, we are going to offer uh, one seminar every month, more or less, until May. And this is the first seminar. We are going to learn about uh, how uh, the plasma etching is, uh, takes place in a fab. The plasma etch the etching in general is very important for, uh, uh, for to, to bring the wafers and, and checks. And the, the, the technique called plasma it is even more important now. And here we have today two gentlemen, one from uh, Tokyo Electron, uh, 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 Alok Ranjan. He, uh, is, he works, uh, he has you have a, a PhD from uh, Houston. Yes. And uh, he's uh, one of the, uh, the engineers that it is in Albany working with, uh, with Tokyo Electron. And you are especially the etching as yes. well, plasma etching, right? And then we have Craig uh, also working at, uh, out of CNRC in Albany, uh, working with the Sematec International or International Sematec. Sematec is a consortium of companies all over the world. Uh, that uh, with the purpose of uh, creating new technology and to help uh, also uh, uh, companies uh, like Global Foundry and all uh, intend to, to achieve uh, better, be better products. So Simantec is a, uh, uh, used to be in Houston, now they move here to Albany because of the, uh, the boom that we, we have here. So I, I hope you enjoy and remember we are going to give you a, 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 a Part of the final exam will include some of this material. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, actually, um, again, my name is Craig Huffman. I work at uh, International Cimitech as a plasma etch engineer. I've been doing this for a little while, since uh, about 1983, um, long time with TI, and uh, now I've got this opportunity at International Cimitech. Um, as he said, there, there will be an exam. And uh, to get to the exam, I'm going to, I'm going to start off by saying, why are you here? Why did you come? Um, and as I look at this from my point of view as a student some years ago, the only reason I would have come was because my, my prof told me to, right? I mean, that's one reason. Um, the other is that if there was food involved, right, because I was always hungry as a, as a student. And the, and the third reason was there was a job. Right? So when I told people why I'd come to these kinds of things, there was three reasons, J-O-B, right? And that's what we're going to talk about. And so there is a final exam here, and, and it's not going to be from Hudson Valley, but it's actually going to be when you walk into that, that uh, interview, yeah. yeah, the interview, the employment guy is going to be sitting across the table from you, and that's really where the final exam is. Now. This is going to be an hour, hour and a half, two hours, something like that. And you think, well, what am I going to learn in, in an hour and a half or, or so? Again, I thought back to when I was a student. I had a, I had a class. It was a one-hour class, um, half a semester, eight classes. And what they did was they taught things that we didn't get in normal classes, right? Simple stuff, things that you wouldn't get in um, theoretical um, settings. So I went to that class because I had to, right? And I didn't think anything of it, but I took my notes, I passed the test. But I went to the interview with TI in 83 and the, the guy asked me two questions. I had two technical questions during that interview and both of those technical questions came from that simple class. And one of them was, how does a diffusion pump works? What is a diffusion pump and how does it work? We're not gonna tell you about that. Hopefully nobody uses diffusion pumps anymore. And the other question was about linear regression. So the point is, is even something as simple as this, this time that we're going to spend here today, there's going to be some word or some definition or something that comes out of this that you, you'll retain and someone's going to ask you about it in the future and you're going to say, aha, I, I, I spent that time, I spent that time wisely. So hopefully we can communicate something to you today that you'll be able to take away with you and help you in the future. thing to keep in mind, you know, because uh, uh, at interviews in, for technical uh, uh, jobs, 
they actually ask you a couple of technical questions, not only about your life, but it's more or less easy, okay? Thank you. Okay. You introduce yourself. Okay. <laughs> My name is Alok Ranjan, and uh, I'm process leader. So I have uh, many engineers working under me in Albany. And uh, one thing I will add, what Craig said was, you know, why we're here. Okay. So when I was in grad school, and I had to pick an advisor for uh, with whom I worked for five years on my thesis. So the success criteria was, you know, two things. Was after graduating, what I'm going to get, what kind of job I'm going to get. You know, is high pay job or low pay job? Is high tech job or, uh, you know, non high tech job? And third thing is, is it interesting? So, if you like what you do, and if it pays well. That's all we want. And in the next one hour or two hours, depending on your interest, so you'll see that uh, it's very interesting. At least to us, I've been working on plasma for the last 10 years. It's every day. Is, today is always more interesting than yesterday because so much is changing. And but we'll not go into complexity today. Mostly we'll go through the simplicity of plasma H so that uh, you get a kind of sense what we are doing and uh, how you can see yourself doing these things in future. So, let's start. Sure. So this is a, the outline that we're going to we're going to cover today. We're going to talk a little bit about how semiconductors are processed, just the general overview of how you build transistors and, and connect them to the outside world. Um, we, this is a plasma course, so it'd be, um, it'd be a fault if we didn't define what a plasma is and what a glow discharge is. And so we're going to try to make that uh, um, pretty straightforward and pretty um, Pretty the simplest of terms, but it but it's it's the the simplicity of it that really makes the the plasma work. Um, we're going to cover a little bit about the hardware, um, what the tools of the trade are, uh, chemistry. Actually, <laughs> unfortunately, we're going to show you some some real chemistry that that uh, that we think goes on inside a plasma, and it's actually what makes the 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 process work. We can, you can remove material from any wafer using bowling balls that look like argon and just beat stuff off like a, a jackhammer, but actually through the chemistry, you can actually make plasmas do things that, uh, that you want them to do. Um, and then a little bit about some of the basic process um, characterization, um, what a process engineer does, and a little bit on the future. And just to give you an idea, did, how many people work with, does anybody in here work with wood? Does anyone build construction, craftsman, hammer, nail? Okay, so to give you an idea what plasma is in, in, in terms that we have a way to connect, um, the plasma etch is the part where you cut the piece of wood. So once you cut it, you can't stretch it anymore, right? You can, you can make it shorter, but Plasma is a way, the way to think about it is, is once you run this process, it's, a, it's the cutting of the wood. So you, it's, a, it's a commitment. It's a, it's a very complex and uh, very uh, definitive uh, process in the, in the flow. So it has to be done correctly. So you're all familiar with these devices, right? What's that? This is Xbox, old, old school PC. Then you have all these smartphones. And you have electronics in cars, space, ships, everywhere you have electronics. And uh, it's, it's amazing what iPad can do or, you know, what. Uh, and for example, Xbox, this one, it has the most advanced chip, one of the most advanced computer chip in the Xbox. 
And do you know where that Xbox chip is made? Any guess? Close answer. It will be made in Malta soon. Right now it's made in Fishkill. It has been being made in Fishkill for uh, last uh, eight years. So. But we are all familiar with this. But what goes inside this, to make this work, you need computer chip. And, and this computer chip is made in this kind of equipment. And this cost $400, $200. This one, I'm not even sure how much it costs now. <laughs> this one bit contract, $100. How much this equipment cost? Any guess? <laughs> you can go a little bit lower. <laughs> Generally about uh, 10 million mark. Just the selling price. Then you have service and everything, other cost. So, 10 million equipment makes a $100 uh, uh, phone or $400 computer. The thing is, it makes in volumes, makes thousands of these devices. So, our job is here, you know, to understand the system, how this works to make this happen. And uh, to give you a perspective, in 1958, this was the first transistor invented, actually IC circuit, made in TI in 1958. One, one transistor. See the size of it, <coughs> huge, maybe this size. And this is uh, Intel's uh, new chip. Size is about this much, square. It has 2.9 billion transistors How, in uh, only 40, 50 years. You go from here to here. Very challenging, amazing. How this happens, every two year, we make the device half. The size becomes half every two years. So now we are here. It will be difficult to go next step because we are hitting the limits of uh, physics. So we can see, and you can see this in a museum. Smithsonian, I think, I think that's in the Smithsonian, yeah. no? It's in, in New Jersey, the museum. Yeah. I think so, I think so, yes. So you, you can see this in all your devices, uh, the new Intel devices. And this one, you have to go to museum to find it. <laughs> so. Oh, sorry. I think no. And uh, what kind of scale we're talking about? This is 300 millimeter wafer. This is how it looks like. It has, generally it has 50 to 300 dies. One die is one computer chip. You can see the size. And this one is generally a inch, one inch by one inch in general. And now look at the dimension over here. The one transistor size is 50 nanometer. How much is 50 nanometer, Craig? So, um your hair is 75 microns. Microns is a thousand nanometers, something like that. Yeah. And so 50 nanometers, you can put a hundred on there. Well, that you've only taken up 5,000 and you've still got 200, 2,000, you still got a quarter more of your hair. Okay. If you can, you know, that's hard to imagine, right? Um, I think a blood cell is 200, um, 200 microns, mm -hmm. something like that. So you could put like um, 4,000 of these 50 nanometer wide devices across the blood cell. And, and this is what they really look, this is what a transistor, I mean, if you look at that, you see how the, the precision to the, to the 
um, the gate structure. No, I'm sorry. Here is the gate, the, the size of the gate. So, the yeah. so you see how vertical the sidewalls are? That's very important. Um, you see how flat these surfaces are that are right next to the gate? This is very important. You see this, to give you an idea of, of, the, of, the, of uh, the precision here, you, okay, the gate area is just what's below this rectangle, right? It's just right here where I'm shining. You see this little bitty um, offset piece in the, in the dark material? The dark material is silicon. The depth of that piece determines whether you have a, uh, a transistor that runs at 3 gigahertz, 2.8, 2.7, 2.6. If it gets really, really deep, it, it's really slow. And if it's very, very flat, then, then your, your, your transistor is very, very fast. And the control of that particular um, offset is, is an etch. And that's the, the precision that we have to work toward. Um, there's many etches here. There's one that defines the, the gate. There's one that defines these, um, this, these materials we call um, sidewalls. Uh, and we'll, I, we got a slide that talks about that, so we won't get into the details of that, but just to give you an idea of, of what we're looking at here. And if this is 50 nanometers, this distance right here is something significantly less than 50 nanometers. So it's a, it's a precision... Um, process. And you can see the one of the dimensions here. This is silicon oxide layer between gate and the substrate. It's a 1.2 nanometer of oxide. This is all hitting the size of molecules or atoms. And as Craig said, you know, this, you see the step here, this determines the performance. So this is actually not the real device. Intel just published it, they don't want to show the real. In reality, like what IBM makes or Gold Foundry will make, this, right now this recess is about two nanometer. They want zero, zero nanometer recess, means no step. So edge precision has to be at atomic scale. And, and this is like uh, for last five years we are achieving that. So all the devices now you have in all the iPads or uh, Xbox is even better than this device, what I'm showing here. Now I have a video for you. Welcome to Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. TSMC pioneered the dedicated semiconductor foundry business model and leads the foundry segment with its trinity of strengths, technology leadership, manufacturing excellence, and customer partnership. TSMC's fabrication facilities, or FABs, feature the most advanced manufacturing equipment. Here, TSMC researches and applies a wide variety of process technologies to manufacture high-quality integrated circuits for customers. Now, let's look inside the fabs at TSMC to learn about the IC manufacturing process. The fab is a giant clean room equipped with many types of air filters to keep the manufacturing environment free from contamination. Air from the outside must pass through many types of filters to eliminate all kinds of particles in order to maintain air quality of the clean room. In addition, the temperature, humidity, electrostatic discharge, pressure, magnetic fields and vibrations in the clean room must also be controlled. Pure water, as well as special liquids and gases required for the manufacturing of integrated circuits are supplied directly to manufacturing equipment through pipelines running throughout the clean room. Before entering the clean room, personnel must wear clean room garments, shoes, gloves, and face masks to ensure cleanliness. After changing clothes, personnel enter the air wash room to completely remove dust and particles from their bodies 
preventing suspended particles from entering the fan. An integrated circuit, or IC, is a system of electronic components and circuits miniaturized onto a silicon chip one centimeter square or smaller. An integrated circuit can process a large number of electronic signals and perform many complex functions. If we look at a chip under a microscope, we can see that the apparently smooth surface is actually stacked with many components of different heights and shapes. How are these components fabricated? Let's start with the raw materials used to make the IC. Silicon wafers are a type of semiconductor material and the basic raw material used in the manufacturing of ICs. By doping the wafer with elements such as arsenic, phosphorus, and boron, the conductivity and characteristics of the wafer are changed. To make silicon wafers that meet the requirements for flatness and uniformity needed to make ICs, raw polycrystalline silicon material is first heated to a high temperature. By adjusting speed and temperature, a cylindrical ingot of crystalline silicon is pulled out. The outer surface of the silicon ingot is then ground to a uniform diameter and sliced into thin silicon wafers. The edge and surface of the silicon wafers are ground and polished. We can now use this silicon wafer to begin manufacturing integrated circuits. IC design engineers first use computer-aided design systems to lay out the patterns for each circuit of the IC. By using electron beams or lasers, these patterns are then transferred to photomasks. The number of photomasks required for an integrated circuit product usually depends on the complexity of the design and the process technologies. Generally, it requires at least 20 to 30 layers of photomasks, and the alignment between each layer must be very accurate. The fab for manufacturing ICs is divided into several major areas. Each area has a unique function. In the diffusion area, the silicon wafers are sent into an oven tube for thin film growth at high temperatures. The silicon wafer stays in this environment, where temperature and gas flow rate are accurately controlled for a period of time, and the surface reacts with the high temperatures and forms an insulating silicon compound film. Ion implantation is a process used to implant charged ions into a specific region of the silicon wafer. Conductivity is changed by controlling the concentration and depth of the ions. In the chemical vapor deposition, CVD area, chemical reactions occur in the reaction chamber and the reactive chemical vapors form a solid state reactant which is deposited on the chip surface as a thin film. The wafer is now covered in a thin film and sent to the photolithography area for transfer of circuit patterns. A thin layer of photoresist, a photosensitive liquid, is uniformly coated on the wafer surface. The photomask is then placed over the wafer. Light is exposed onto the wafer through the photomask, creating a pattern of exposed and unexposed areas based on the pattern of the photomask. Unexposed areas remain covered with photoresist. After photolithography processing, the silicon wafer will be sent into the etching area to etch out the exposed regions, that is, the regions uncovered by the photoresist. The remaining pattern is the area needed for the circuits. Once the wafer surface is covered with several thousand to several million electronic components, the components are connected with metal conducting wires so that they can perform their designated functions. Here, the surface etched wafer is sputter coated with a thin layer of metal film processed with photolithography and etched to remove the unnecessary parts and leave the metal wires connecting each electronic element. The chemical mechanical polishing area uses mechanical principles and chemical reactions to effectively remove materials on the silicon wafer and make it flat in preparation for later thin film deposition. These complicated and precise processes are repeatedly performed in the fab to complete the manufacture of ICs. Each silicon wafer is made up of hundreds or even thousands of chips. Finally, these chips must pass the acceptance test. After passing basic inspection, the chips are then diced, packaged and tested according to the purpose of each integrated circuit. Throughout the entire manufacturing cycle, the silicon wafers must be transported back and forth between the different manufacturing areas and manufacturing tools. In a conventional 8-inch fab, 
the operator usually uses a cart to transport the silicon wafers manually. In recent years, technological progress in the semiconductor industry has increased wafer size to 12 inches from 8 inches. This allows manufacturers to get more chips from a single silicon wafer and reduces the unit cost of IC manufacturing. The weight of a 12-inch wafer is twice that of an 8-inch silicon wafer, and the weight of 12-inch wafers together with the carrier tool are too heavy to transport manually. As a result, they are carried by automatic material handling systems. TSMC leads the foundry segment in introducing automatic material transport systems and automatic real-time dispatch systems in its 12-inch fabs. Everything from wafer transportation to manufacturing is controlled by an automated production system, improving the efficiency of the fab through automation. This was an introduction to TSMC's fabs and manufacturing process. Thank you for watching this video. We couldn't, we couldn't take you to the fab, right? So we did the next best thing that we could do, we could think of is, is actually bring the fab here and show you. I don't know if you've had any experience or been into a wafer fab or not, but that's, that's exactly what the inside of a state-of-the-art fab looks like and, is, and how it operates. And now, this is the latest chip again. Now this dimension is gone all the way to 22 nanometer. And uh, this little bit older generation chip, you, s you saw in the video that you have a device on the chip, this is silicon substrate, then you have uh, your gates and source and drain. All you do is connect this transistor to outside world with the copper wires. And these copper wires are of 100 nanometer, 200 nanometer, you know, 500 nanometer size. And uh, if you go back one, I just have a. So if you look at all the applications of plasma in this in this cross section, these are SEM pictures that we're showing, right? So these are these are cross sections of devices that come from an, a scanning electron microscope, and. You can see all the applications. Everything that is, a f this is these features that you see wouldn't be there without etch, without a plasma etch. Also, this material, this gray material, is there because of a, a different kind of plasma, it's a, de a deposition. So you can create plasmas that deposit material, and you can create plasmas that actually etch and remove the material. And so there's, there's, a, there's a ton of application here for, for plasma. And uh, this is a kind of loop of or flow of wafer fabrication. I think you already saw that in the video, how it's made. <clears throat> and this is in words. So you have, uh, you grow a large crystal, then you slice them into wafers. And after that, all you do is you deposit film and then polish it, then you print something and then you transfer the pattern to the film by plasma etching. And you just repeat this over and over again to have different layers and layers of device and after that interconnects. And after that uh, you make your device. The main important thing is you have to deposit and polish. Deposition is using plasma. Then you do your photolithography for printing. Then again, you transfer the pattern again by plasma. So you can see that two of three most important uh, processing involves plasma. So it's that important in semiconductor industry. And now we'll go to defining what is plasma. I will not, uh, will not go in details of plasma, just, you know, Kind of introduction. So, what is plasma? Is there plasma in the room? No. Actually, there is. Well, in, the in this, yes, in lights, the electric tube or no? 
the what we call fluorescent tube is a DC plasma and this is a example of that. You have uh, all you need is a electric field in a specific pressure. So, you have a battery connected to tube this is at some pressure then you have electric field between this electrode and this electrode. So, what happens in this system when you apply electric field? Yes. So, it, it gives ener imparts energy to. So, in this room, are the electrons in this room? There are some you know flying around. So, in this tube also, they have one electron or two electron or something. And they get accelerated by this electric field and then gain energy. And once they gain energy, it ionizes the gas in the tube. And after that, you have electrons and ions and the background neutrals or the background gas. So, then you get a plasma. And uh, so, one electron makes two electron, two makes four, four makes 16, it keeps on going. So, you have avalanche of this is by avalanche ionization. And one important thing here is that this can happen only at a particular pressure. So, that is where vacuum system comes in. So, you need to you know you will learn plasma, but you need to learn vacuum as well. Right? And uh, I am calling it a cold plasma or our plasma, because there are plasma everywhere. I mean the tubes, in semiconductor tools and in stars, we have uh, sun is a plasma, sun is most of the uh, and uh, lightning is a form of plasma. Yeah. It is just really high voltage. Yeah. So, but in our plasma, what we use in semiconductor etching tools is uh, cold. When I say cold, means the electrons are hot, background gas and uh, new ions are cold, means there is a temperature difference in the system. Generally, it is uh, we pressure, we operate is uh, 0.1 milliliter or 1 milliliter to tens of milliliter and the, this kind of density. And I would maybe you can focus here that how much we ionize in our tools, how much of the background gas is ionized. Mostly it is uh, 1 in a million to 1 in 10, that kind of ionization we are talking about. So, I will define plasma as a weakly ionized gas. Plasma is nothing more than a weakly ionized gas. and how it uh, helps us with etching. So, for example, this is a very simple system. You can see we just have a voltage applied with RF and then your wafer sits here. Then in, in, in the chamber, so all the electrons will crack the molecules. It can make uh, neutrals Cl and it will make ions Cl plus. So, what will happen? So, now we are looking at the chamber as a system. Now, we are zooming in at the wafer surface. What is happening here? So, you have ions. Generally, ions are anisotropic. Anisotropic means they have energy and so they are directional. So, they are coming to wafer with high velocity or high energy and directional. It will hit wafer 90 degree. And then, what will happen at the, if I zoom in? at the wafer surface. We have mask, underlying layer and this for example, in this one we are etching polysilicon. So, this, this ions will hit in this direction and etching anisotropically. And now, I will zoom in what is happening at the surface. The surface you have silicon crystalline structures. So, you are hitting with Cl 2 plus very high velocity and this will you know, damage these layers and your byproduct will come out. So, you go from reactor scale all the way to atomic scale. So, it is understanding different length scales. So, 
If you look at the $10 million tool, it's very complex. But if you uh, study the system in parts, then you can understand everything going from the tool, the outside of the tool looks like a black box, and learn everything what's happening at the atomic level, and which, which requires uh, like a high school physics, chemistry, and small amount of maths. And now this is uh, many components of the system. So you have your plasma etcher, but that's only a part of the system. There are many, many components to make that happen. So you have your chamber walls, and wafer sits on a pedestal. We call it uh, electrostatic chuck. And then to maintain, and then you have process gas supplies, goes through gas panel, and MFs mass flow controllers. To maintain this particular pressure in the chamber, you have a gate valve and pumps. So you have turbo molecular pump here, and in the subfab, you have a roughing pump. So here is the vacuum system involved in this plasma. Then you need to monit monitor many things in the chamber. What is the pressure? So you have pre pressure sensor, then you have, you monitor plasma emissions, you have endpoint, and to put power in the system, you have a matching network, and then you need multitude of RF generators. This is the simplest uh, system we can think of. In reality, it's much more complex than that. Yeah. To give you an idea of the com how complex um, the systems are that, that these that we use, um, they're, they're networks unto themselves. This is just the chamber. This is, this is just the process chamber where the, where the actual processing actually happens. And each one of these items, generator, the network, pressure controller, these pumps even, gas delivery, vacuum control, turbo control, endpoint signal where you actually control how long the etch goes on. Each one of those items is controlled by the microprocessor for this chamber. The chamber has its own microprocessor. The code written to control this activity is on the order of what it takes to fly an airplane. It's, it's a really complex piece of software that thankfully I don't have to, I just know that there's a, a computer screen I can manipulate that com computer screen and control all this that goes on. But I know behind it, there's, n there's a lot of things that go on to, to make this process actually happen. Now, you, you, you gotta get the wafer into the chamber, right? Because you got this chamber, you wanna run a process, so you gotta get the wafer in there. There's a robot system that actually, we, we saw in the video of those frog leg things doing this, and wafers moving around, right? The system that controls those frog leg um, robots is a microprocessor unto itself. And then to get the wafers onto that, that robot, there's another one. So this, just within this tool, there, there's three microprocessors. There's a network, there's a, there's a local area network just for that system. And then you throw in um, a, a fourth um, computer, if you will, that controls the endpoint system. This is a really, really complex um, software controlled tool that, that runs from a computer screen that looks a lot like a Microsoft um, Excel spreadsheet, for example. So um, thankfully, we don't have to keep all that in, in, in mind when we're working. So. Even though this system, and as Craig describes, very, very complex system, but does that mean we, we cannot understand it? Right? To do our job, we have to understand the system. And the only way to understand the system is to have basic understanding. Yeah. And basic understanding system as a whole, like, you know, overall picture, and what each component is doing, and how they're interacting with each other. So even though it's very complex, but with you know, 
right amount of training and right amount of motivation, you guys should be able to understand everything what's on this slide and much more which is not on this slide. And I think we actually break it down into the individual pieces now to give you an idea about the, the, the simplicity of, the, of what goes on. I'm going to talk a little bit about roughing or the vacuum system. There's roughing pumps, turbo pumps, um, pressure range. Um, there's a gas handling system that we just talked a little bit about. This thing controls uh, gas flows from liters per minute down to, to on the order of a uh, one cc per minute. Um, cooling systems, they're very, very important. Um, power, we, can, we have some RF generators that start out very, very low in power and, and can create quite a bit of uh, a power. And to give you an idea, 3,000 watts, that's a lot of heat, right? When I was living in the dorm, I had a 1,300 watt electric heater to keep myself warm. This thing's like three t or twice that, right? So I was staying warm with that. This thing generates a lot of heat. So there's that kind of power is, uh, is involved here. A um, little bit about plasma diagnostics and then again, uh, the chemistry involved is, is what makes it happen and we're gonna focus just on, on the halogen column of, uh, of the periodic table, so. So the basic vacuum systems that are used on, on most every plasma system involved, whether it's DEP or etch, has a roots blower, which is nothing, I look at it as just a big fan. It, it blows large volumes of, of, uh, of gas. It can handle lots and lots of gas, but it doesn't really pump to a very low pressure. Um, that's why you have what's uh, kind of what I've laid out here is you've got a roots blower that sets on top of what a very common pump in the industry is these rotary vane um, systems. And so you've got this system which will actually get you to a um, militor level of, of pressure. Um, these systems are really um, interesting in the fact that they don't use oil. Many of them don't use any oil as, as for lubricant, but they use gas as a lubricant. Because oil, um, no matter how hard you try, the oil from a, a pump like this will actually end up back in the process chamber, and that would be extremely detrimental to, to what, we, what we try to build. So these, these systems now are using like nitrogen gas to, to actually lubricate them, and they get very, very hot, of course. And then, of course, to maintain um, low pressures with relatively high flows, these pumps need assistance. And um, that's what this turbo molecular pump, we call them turbos, just the general jargon is a turbo pump. And I look at this as just a, it's very similar to a, a jet engine. It's got many, many fans that spin incredibly fast. Um, and they basically move gas, as you might imagine. There's a fan here that actually hits the molecule and pushes it to the next stage. And that stage hits that molecule and pushes it on, and so on and so forth, and it, and it removes it from the chamber. And so you would use this kind of system to get your um, process into uh, low pressure, but to achieve process pressures and, and maintain gas flows, you have to have a, a, a turbo molecular pump to to make that happen. And uh, one interesting part is that <coughs> these, these structures, the fins, they rotate at a molecular speed. That's why they're called turbo molecular pump. The speed of spinning of this is speed of molecule. And, uh, and this is so interesting, even though it looks very dry and uh, not interesting. So imagine these things suck air or suck gas from a system. But this pushes molecules. So it's very interesting that this is a, this can achieve one tor, 900 millitor. These can achieve 10 to the power minus six tor 
it's almost uh, like uh, almost like a space not exactly space but almost like what's happening in the space or that kind of pressure can generate in your chamber so basic gas delivery systems are are controlled by units of look like this on the tool actually this is a surface mount system that you can actually plug and play out of a gas panel a gas panel looks something like this typically um, where we have these are mfc's mass flow controllers um, just many of these mounted you can see it's a really complex system in that we've got gas valves on both sides of the mfc um, we also have ways to um, purge these mfc's um, to keep them clean so that they'll function as we expect them to. Uh, I put this picture in for, for two reasons. One, it's a mass flow controller. And the other thing is, is that you see it's in a plastic bag. Everything we get, everything that goes into the clean room has to be clean, right? You don't want to put a bunch of particles in there because particles create defects and defects create um, non-yielding parts. And non-yielding parts means you don't get paid. So you gotta have everything really, really clean. And, Usually these things come double bagged where um, you move into a, a staging area and remove the outer bag, wipe that bag off, and then you move into the clean room um, or another staging area, open that bag and take the part out and wipe it off, and then you can actually go into the clean room. It's a, it's a, it's, you have to keep things clean as they move through the, and everything, um, these tools that you showed a picture of, they'll come bagged. Um, it's really um, has to be done so that we can we can maintain a, a work environment. Okay, this is really a, a transducer. It's a really um, rather um, straightforward transducer, and I'll try to explain a little bit about how the thing works. Um, gases have uh, have properties to them, especially with heat, and so you can program this um, unit to work with a particular gas at a particular heat capacity for that gas. And what happens is, is that these systems actually monitor the, the heat flow between two sensors within there and they raise and lower a valve to change that flow of heat so that you get the, the amount of gas delivered to your chamber that you're asking for. So it's very clean. Clean room is very clean. So if you want to stay healthy, you should come to clean room. <laughs> so uh, another item that we, we take a lot of uh, a care in, doing, in, in controlling is the, the wafer temperature. The, the wafer sits on an ESC, an electrostatic chuck, which is just exactly what it says it is. A wafer sits there. We put a charge on that chuck and it electrostatically holds that, that wafer on the, on the chuck and it won't move. And it actually is pulled down against the chuck so that we can use systems like this, a heat exchanger, if you will, to maintain the temperature of the, of the wafer. Um, chain, these, these systems use, um, you, you think heat exchanger, well, I just water, air, um, actually, some of them are really complex in that ethylene glycol is used as one material that flows through the, the heat exchanger into the e-chuck. Um, we have um, oils, a golden oil um, that actually is, flows through the, these systems. Um, and fluorine are some really strange exotic um, chemistry. So these are, again, they're, they're very complex, but then as you think about them just as a heat exchanger, uh, maintain temperature of a, of a wafer, it's really a, a really straightforward way to think about this particular aspect of it. This picture I'm seeing after 10 years. I studied this for uh, one semester in my undergrad for chemical engineering. So heat transfer, we study this for one semester. So this is, uh, you can see the complexity, so many things involved in plasma matching. Not only the system itself, but you know, these are designed by mechanical engineers, you know, optimized by chemical engineers. 
and uh, this is and now you need some power to ignite plasma or generate plasma right so we generally use rf discharge or rf power rf means it's like ac only it's very high frequency in this room the elect all electricity is uh, 60 hertz in this one generally we operate at uh, 100 hertz to 100 megahertz but 13.56 is most, most common. Actually 15 years ago, we only had 13.56 megahertz RF. Can you guess why we industry use for 30, 40 years 13.56 megahertz? Why did we use 13.56 megahertz? Answer is not technical, you know, just uh, something It, it, it worked, it yes. Works, yeah. First, yeah. It works first really requirement, well. <laughs> yes. Any guess? It's very, because FCC, FCC regulated what kind of frequency used and they said to use 13.56. So industry used 13.56 till late 90s. Now we are using all kind of frequencies. So. And, uh, the, why we use RF is because you know, wafer has many insulator layer and you cannot put DC power through insulator. So one interesting thing of using RF is you can put power in the plasma through insulators. So AC can pass through insulator, but DC current or DC power cannot go through insulators. So that was the main motivation of using RF frequencies. And now you know why 13.56 is used all over the world. And uh, it looks like this, a black box with some, some numbers showing up all the time. But inside, uh, it's very complex and it's job of RF engineers. They are specifically trained for this. But as far as plasma is, is concerned and this power can be lost as heat in the external circuit and cannot go to the plasma. So you need a matching network. So matching network is nothing more than a two capacitor and one inductor. And these capacitor, capacitance changes to match impedance of this system to the impedance of the outer circuit. So, so yeah, so just a um, little follow on here. The matching network, back in the day, this was a manual activity where you actually turned to knobs and you actually watched your glow and you watched a power needle and you wanted to minimize the, the reflected power into the chamber and maximize the, the delivery of it. Now it's all computer, um, controlled by a computer, thankfully, because these things would be very, very difficult to, to deal with on a on a day-to-day -day basis because every time you etch, every time an etch happens, the chamber changes. And every time you change the chamber, you change how this system right here functions. And so this is a, this is a never-ending tweak that goes on because when you etch, you, you not only etch what's on the wafer, right, but everything else around it, you want, everything else around it reacts. Of course, you select materials that minimize that, but the thing changes, the system changes every time a wafer goes through it. So it's really, um, um, I'm very thankful for, for computer automated network. <laughs> Actually, um, six, seven years ago when I was in grad school, I had to make this by hand. And so I made the reactors, assembled the plates, bought two capacitor from uh, Radio Shack and uh, one inductor from uh, some local hardware, and I had to tune this capacitor <clears throat> and keep on watching plasma till it lights up, okay, hands off, plasma is on. So that's exactly happens, only that it's not manual but controlled by computers. You can imagine it's how difficult using, I used to spend many times hours to match because you, know, you don't know what kind of capacitance you need to, ignite the plasma. So, 
And uh, right now, so you can think of plasma etching system or tool as a chemical reactor. This is nothing more than a chemical reactor. Only difference between what is used in uh, petrochemicals or all other industries is that you have RF on top of a chemical reaction. So you have electromagnetics plus chemical reaction instead of only chemical reaction happening in the reactor. So it's much more challenging and much more interesting than a simple chemical reactor. And uh, there are many, many flavors of, you know, there are many suppliers, like many people who make these kind of equipment and sells to all the companies, Intel, TSMC. And so one kind of plasma etcher is CCP, which is capacitively coupled plasma chamber. When I say capacitively coupled plasma means you have RF power, RF can pass through insulator. And, and what is an insulator? It's just a capacitor. So you can put power through a capacitor. So that's why it's called capacitively coupled plasma reactor. It's, it's the most widely used kind of reactor in semiconductor industry. And it, it, it's the simplest. Um, this, is, this is my model in my head to when I think of a plasma. It's a very, very simple concept. You have a plate that's grounded and you have a powered plate and you put gas in between it and voila, you got a glow. It's really straightforward. Um, it's very, um, and if you guys get this isotropic, anisotropic part, if there's anything to take away today, know the difference between isotropic and anisotropic. I work with vice presidents that get it confused, okay? Isotropic is all direction, right? So this thing is anisotropic. This thing will etch vertically like gangbusters, but it won't etch laterally at all. It won't etch in the, in the etch direction at all. It just goes like a straight. So anisotropic etch, CCP plasma, widely used in the business. And here is a picture of inside of the chamber. Right now, chamber is open. So the upper lid, we just take it off and you can see how does it look. This is a pedestal where wafer sits. You can see, they call ESC. Then these are chamber wall, which are generally coated with some fancy material and very expensive actually. So these parts uh, looks very nice like plastic in this picture and looks like nothing is going on over here because everything happens behind the scenes. You want your, this is like iPad. You don't have but, you know, buttons or all the thing. You just want as cleanest interface you can get. And that's what actually challenge of plasma etch. When we make equipment or when we, you know, even technicians or field service engineers, when they do the maintenance on the tool, it should not have any, any junk or any imperfections. It should look like, you know, this. And most of the chamber do look like this all the time. And then another kind of plasma at chamber is remote plasma. In this case, this is microwave can also ignite plasma. In this case, your plasma is far from your wafer area. In this case, you can have isotrop isotropic etching, which Craig explained that etching in all directions. And isotropic is etching only in one direction, vertical, vertical to the surface. So just the microwave power, when these, and I, I'm fairly sure to even today, the same power supplies that you find in your home microwave, you can find them in these systems as well. It, a microwave generator or a microwave antenna that you have in your home is what you'll find in these systems. Um, you can use them across many different kinds of industries. So your, the microwave in your home, the frequency is tuned to heat the water molecules. 
In this system, the frequency is gigahertz, which is tuned to heat your plasma, or actually in technical sense, heat the electrons. That's the only difference, nothing else. If you can find 2.45 meg uh, gigahertz source, have right amount of pressure, you can have plasma in your kitchen. Yeah. We don't recommend it. Yeah. Do not try at home. There's many things, yeah. <laughs> so we talked about capacitively coupled. The other, and we talked about a remote plasma, which those two systems are very, very, um, very common. This is a, what I can call a, a really high tech um, milling machine or, or router. We were back to the woodworking aspect of it. This system allows you to build a plasma and then it also has a RF on the, uh, on the chuck that you can actually pull um, the reactive ions from this plasma to the wafer selectively with, uh, with power, the right power conditions. It's an inductively coupled system, which means um, you have a chamber in here and then you have a, an antenna that in this case, in these systems, it actually wraps around the, uh, the chamber. There are other systems where the top of the, the chamber is, uh, is flat and on top of that chamber, it has something that looks like the, uh, the cooking element on an electric stove, okay? And basically that delivers the power and it's inductively coupled to the gas uh, in, the, in the plasma chamber. These are in, in atmosphere while this is at, at low pressure. And again, this thing is where we get a really high performance etches. We were showing you the picture of that gate earlier where you had very small offset down into the silicon. This system is what is used to, to create that particular feature in other high tech or high precision um, processing steps. This is just a, a picture of a very common system in the industry in, with, the, with tops on. This particular chamber has the top taken off, but yeah, we call it a Weber grill, okay? Because it looks like a <laughs> Weber grill, okay? Yeah. But it's actually a really complex um, chamber inside here. You have the, the vacuum chamber, you have uh, an antenna, and then through this atmospheric side where the antenna is, they actually have uh, airflow to, to maintain the heat so that you don't overheat um, the antenna in the chamber. It's a, it's a really well-engineered, high-tech system. Oh, go ahead. No, no. I was just gonna say there was a picture of the, the robot, right? And again, there's another oh, yeah. system. Yeah. Uh, another system where you have, you have a, a computer running this part, particular part, which actually puts the wafer in, and that's all it does. It just moves wafers. But, and then you have another um, microprocessor that runs this system. You have another one that runs this system. And you have one that would actually run this system. And so here's a tool that has multiple ports. I think there are tools available now where they have six, eight, six chambers? Yeah, eight chambers. Eight chambers. And so you have eight separate locations where this or a similar robot system can move wafers, right, all around. And then you have all these different chambers around it that can do different kinds of processes. So now we're gonna to transition to the, the, I mean, this is school, right? We, we gotta talk about chemistry, physics. We gotta get into the actual chemistry a little bit. And, and it's not, how to explain? Um, we have ideas about what actually happens in the plasma. We dump a gas in, we break it up as, as Alok mentioned, and you get electrons and you get neutrals and you get radicals. And that we can say, but anything that you do to measure what's in the plasma, you actually change what's going on in the plasma. So it's very, very difficult to get an idea um, specifically with a lot of, uh, a lot of certainty what has actually happened when you, when you have a vacuum chamber, you put CF4 in it, 
you apply power, you get a glow. What's making the glow? Well, you can, you can guess, and we're gonna go through some things here about that, those, those reactions that happen. So again, wel welcome back to Hudson Valley uh, periodic table. Yes, we do use them. We use them a lot. Um, it's very important to know how things react on on the chain on the on the periodic table. I'm going to focus. Or we're going to focus on the column here, the halogen column. This is the the piece that we use. Um, these are the gases that we use: fluorine, chlorine, and bromine, a great deal. But it also helps to know how these interact with the rest of the of the periodic table, and specifically silicon. Um, and the interaction between silicon and oxygen, those are important to know, and then a few of the metals, but we're gonna focus on this because there's way too much information here to, to cover in, in just a few minutes. So on the one uh, interesting fact is, the semiconductor industry is a very lucky industry. We had, uh, by nature, or uh, by periodic table, we've been very lucky. All the devices are semiconductor silicon devices. Imagine if the instead of silicon, we had to work with, let's say, lanthanum or something. There, the, all the progress is made because we got lucky and we are working with silicon. Because. Any guess why we got lucky because silicon worked for semiconductor or as a semiconductor? Pardon me? No, no, no. It's cheap. It's abundant and and no, it's cheap. Yeah. Yeah. If if we had to work with anything other than silicon or you know water or something. The, the price of iPad, you know, maybe 10,000 or million something, right? If there was no silicon device, because it's so cheap and it's abundant in nature. And so the, this cost, the substrate cost is almost nothing. All we spend is all other things. Like, you know, these gases, RF system, gas flows, but the, Wafer cost itself is nothing compared to all other costs. The halogens. Yeah. We, we like the halogens. We like them a lot. <laughs> Fluorine, most reactive element there is. <coughs> Chlorine, it comes in a close second. And uh, bromine has uh, nice properties that, that make um, plasma processing work. Um, when you want to get selectivity, and we'll talk a little bit about selectivity in a few minutes, uh, between two materials, these bromine, chlorine are, are very, very good at that, that, uh, that piece of magic that happens. Um, you can see some, some properties here about these, these gases. Um, we don't use iodine or I'm not even sure what AT is. That's how little I know about the rest of the, the halogen column. Um, and these are all come, come in gas form. They're all, all uh, um, high pressure. Well, two of them are relatively high pressure. Bromine is actually, uh, um, when it's in the bottle, it's actually a liquid. And you actually um, have bromine gas coming off that liquid all the time. And so there's a, a temperature control um, situation that has to, that can be applied to make bromine actually flow continuous. Um, uninterrupted, uh, repeatable. So fluorine, um, most widely used plasma edge um, gas in, in the semiconductor business. It's very, 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 very reactive. We really like fluorine. Um, you don't get just F2 uh, out of a bottle. Um, it has to come in, in different forms. And these are the most typical gases that we use um, as fluorine sources. And you can see that um, there's an interesting relationship here in the, 
in the carbon, hydrogen, and the amount of fluorine. Um, and we, I've kind of linked here um, CF4, give you an idea. Um, CHF3, CH2F2, and CH3F. Um, the relationship here between CH and, and fluorine is what gives the, each one of these gases its ability to do something a little bit different, okay? Um, when you look at a carbon-hydrogen chain, you get, right, you get a hydrogen, right, and you get carbon connected to it all over, right? And, and that's a, that's Teflon, basically, right? It's a, it's, it's a polymeric film that uh, nothing sticks to, that things don't react with. And you can use these different gases to create that unreactive piece to give you selectivity, to let you, your chemistry actually do its magic. This is the magic in, the, in this particular um, gas chemistry, is the, is the, the CH um, and the amount of CH that you have in a, from a particular source of gas. We're, here we have a little bit, so you take, a, take some of this and take some of this and you get a little bit of, of protection from the, the CH molecule. Contrast this with CHF3. Um, a little bit of this goes a very, very long way. In fact, you can put um, a small amount too much in and it blocks, it stops the edge completely. And when, I, when I'm talking about gas, uh, gas flows here, if you flow on the order of like 50 SCCM of, of CHF3, then CH3F to get a similar level would be on the order of four or five SCCM. Some applications, um, yeah, I just hit a few of them here with some of the gases that are used, um, starting from the very, very beginning of the, of the process flow where we do shallow trench isolation. Okay, what is shallow trench isolation? Well, you got an NMOS device here and you got a PMOS device here. Let's think about it differently. You got a transistor here that you don't want to talk to this transistor. You got to put some isolation between it. So what we do is we, we etch a trench using SF6 into the, into the silicon, then we refill it with a dielectric with insulation, and now this device doesn't talk to this device. It's pretty straightforward. We just do that on a very, it's all over the chip. There's tons of these things. About 50% of the chip can be, um, can be exposed here up to that much. Um, moving along the process flow in, in uh, sidewalls, we, I showed the picture where we had a gate and we had sidewalls on the side of it. Well, we use these gases to actually create those sidewalls. It's a really straightforward, simple way to uh, process, but uh, we'll get into that in just a, a little bit. Um, but again, the sidewall is the difference between a a transistor working really, really fast, and a transistor just lighting up your, your Game Boy or whatever. I don't, Game Boys are old, man. I just dated myself. Um, I don't even have a cell phone, okay? I mean, thank you for having cell phones. I appreciate that, but uh, uh, I just dated. Hmm? I appreciate that. I really, really do. Um, and I also say, if you have a cell phone, you need to get a new one every year or so to keep the business going, okay? Because we all want jobs in it, right? So it's a self-proliferating thing if we get a new cell phone all the time. I know, <laughs> there's, a, there's a circle there. Um, interconnect, the way you get the transistors connected to the outside world, the way to form the insulation around the wires, and then a protective overcoat. And I got a real interesting tale here about protective overcoat. It's the last step, okay? So the last thing you do is you build these pads and you put a, you, you, you put a oxide, you put an insulator over the top of it and then you open up to the pad, right? And then a wire bonder comes along and puts a big old wire bond on that pad. And these pads are like a um, 100 micron by 100 micron square. And that's how you, and then that bond, ball bond goes to the outside world. That, uh, that pad has to be opened up. It's an aluminum pad to be exposed. And it's covered by an SO, an oxide layer. And you use fluorine to etch it with. 
And one thing that goes on in the world is you think, well, if I etch, I, and I have um, a great reaction between SiO2 and fluorine, and aluminum and fluorine don't react, then I can etch for a very, very long time on my protective overcoat, and I'll have my aluminum exposed to the ball bond, right? Because I want to make a good contact to the outside world. Well, as it turns out, and this is, I have personal experience with this, if you leave an aluminum film in the, in the fluorine plasma for too long, you form aluminum fluoride, which is a dielectric, and you can't probe through it. You can't make electrical contact through it. It doesn't function. It doesn't let that function happen. So sometimes we think, oh, more is better. Not necessarily that's the case with when you work with, with etching materials. Um, etching longer doesn't necessarily make the system open up more, or it doesn't necessarily make the, the materials go away. You can actually create problems that, uh, that you don't want don't to have in your, on your wafer. Chlorine, um, we really like chlorine. It's a, uh, it, it reacts spontaneously with aluminum. You, if you have aluminum and you have chlorine, you put the two together, you get aluminum chloride without, without having to add anything to that. Um, it doesn't react with SiO2. You typically get it from um, some very corrosive gases, so that you have to have a, a, a very, um, uh, special gas system to deliver these gases to the chamber. Um, this is an, uh, an idea of what the uh, two chlorine atoms look like. I thought that was kind of interesting. We have orbitals and you have these two electrons that share each other or a different um, structure. And this is an idea about how you can have an aluminum edge that stops on silicon dioxide and it actually doesn't etch past the bottom of the, of the aluminum at, at all. It doesn't, you can see that this is this is a flat surface here. And back to the, the aluminum, this reaction right here that spontaneously happens. Again, a full disclosure. Uh, what do we have in our house that's chlorine? Bleach. Yeah, bleach. Um, so my wife came in, we have just been married, I just learned about aluminum etch. I was doing some aluminum etch. She shows me a pot that's just dirty as all get out. We burned rice in it or something foolish. I thought, hey, I can use my chemistry. So I took some bleach, dumped it in there, and I put the pot on the, on the shelf. And she's like, do you need to do anything with it? No, 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 just let it go. It'll, it'll react. It'll, you'll have a reaction that happens. It'll just normally, <laughs> everything will be fine. <clears throat> I forgot about it. And then the next day, here comes my wife with the pan and she'd put water in it, and it was just raining <laughs> through the bottom of it, okay? So this thing really does happen. It'll happen with metals that are exposed to atmosphere, and these holes, there were, there were thousands of pinholes through the bottom of a pan, and it only took 12, 16 hours to, to occur. Hmm? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So the bromine is a, the third and final um, gas from the, the list of halogens that we use. Um, we, you, we get it from HBr, which is a, a reddish brown liquid um, in, the, in the cylinder. Um, it has a very special delivery system because of the low pressure, the vapor pressure that from, the, from the liquid HBr. And, uh, the handling of this is one part of it, but once the, the HBR gets to the wafer, once the bromine gets to the wafer, you can actually have it um, do the reaction that you want, which is silicon bromine, SIBR4, you can get that to happen. But also some things that can occur if you have, once, you've, once this reaction is finished, is you can actually form what's called a, a bromine crystal and they actually look like crystals when you look at them in a microscope. And these crystals can be dealt with in a, in a couple of ways. 
Um, one is, is you can just heat up the wafer and they'll evaporate off. Um, another way is to use another plasma. So you've done your bromine etch, you've etched your silicon. You can expose that uh, wafer to a, a short oxygen plasma and actually react away these, these bromine particles that would cause defects and cause yield um, impact. Um, metal gates, all levels of silicon are, are handled by this. And this gives you an idea about, just scratch the surface about what plasma etch, plasma characterization, um, what we do, what Alok has actually um, performed. Is he actually measured a, measures an etch rate of a film. We'll talk a little bit about how that happens. And, and he varies the, the amount of HBR in a plasma where we have HBR and, and argon here. And so as you increase the amount of, of uh, HBR in this plasma, you see that uh, you actually get a peak here in, uh, in what we call etch selectivity between these two films. And those kinds of things are very important to know when it comes to, to setting up a process to actually build transistors. So we talked about, we've introduced you to the, to the wafer fab. We showed the film. Um, Lok dis described what a glow discharge is or a plasma. Um, we've covered a lot about the hardware and, and we keep referring back to the hardware which is an important component in, in plasma edge. Chemistry, which is where the magic actually occurs. And uh, now we want to talk a little bit about um, the basics of the process, the, the, the concept of what an etch rate is, and then how that feeds into what is called selectivity. Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about the characterization, what the selectivity actually means in, in process characterization. So for us, like there are many <coughs> success criteria, right, for plasma etch. We want to etch fast. We want to have selectivity means we want to etch one material, but not etch another one. And then, so, so what's, what's uh, wrong with plasma etch is described on this one. What will happen when you go to industry is like Craig will come to me and you know, say, can you give me selectivity of 10, means etch rate of one material is 10 times faster than one material, or can you give me etch rate of 1000 uh, angstrom per minute, something like this. And then some of my engineers will go to, there's a Scott, will come to me and ask, Craig ask me this. Okay, go to your tool or the equipment and he will see on the panel RF power, pressure, you know, gas flow, frequency, these kind of things, which he has to put on the equipment and then run the wafer. The problem is, we discuss all these things. How does this goes to here. How does this, if I change power from 1000 to 2000, what will happen? What will happen to etch rate or an isotropy or selectivity? So that's the challenge of the plasma etch is that you have operating variable, then you have figures of merit or we call it what we want to achieve. But the missing part is what happens in the plasma is big unknown. We guess, we you know, people, Craig has worked 30 years and he has seen almost most of the thing in dry edge, but still we discuss, like, you know, we guess, we don't know exactly. So most of the, the development activities involve linking operating variable or tool panel to wafer performance. This is unknown but we try to guess the best we can. 
So, Craig mentioned that uh, no, two kind of edge you can have. So, one is Craig gives me this wafer. He tells me you have to etch this much material and you have to stop on substrate or underlying layer. So, if I use a isotropic etch, what will happen? It will etch in all directions, this, this and what, same direction. If I use intelligently the tool in an intelligent manner, I can etch like this and a stop, no damage to substrate, very vertical side walls like this. So, most of the time we, had, we want to achieve this, but sometimes requirement is also to etch like this. So, depending on what you want to achieve, okay, I need this, best solution is to use wet etch, wet chemical or remote microwave plasma. If you want to etch like this, then we use CCP, capacitively coupled plasma. So, and uh, after etching, we want to measure how much we etched or what is the rate of etch. That can be generally done on blanket etched where you just have one film, you etch and then go to the measurement tool and you measure you know, the thickness. And so, yeah, so the, the measurement tool is, is the simplest form of the measurement tool is a white light or a light system that actually shines light on the, on the thin film that you're actually working with here. Say this is an SiO2 film on a, on a silicon substrate. And so you shine light on the, on the thin film and you get an interference pattern, right? Off the, you, you, and you see this routinely like um, a common event that you might see this is the oil on water, right? Where you get an interference pattern, you get different colors, right? So, the thickness of these films, there's characteristics about it that a th different thickness has a different in different waveform output. And that's what we're trying to show here. And it's, it's, if you look at one thickness of film, you get this red line as you vary the wavelength and measure the intensity of that light. There's a green line here that's very different and so the thickness of that film is very, very different. If you take the same wavelength or color of light, as you vary the color of light, you look at the intensity and you get these, these different curves here. And, and consequently, the, the blue line is, is a third film. So each, a third thickness of the film. So a system similar to this will create this interference pattern off the, off the thin film, and that interference pattern looks like such, and there's software that tells you, that actually looks at these patterns and tells you how thick the, the film is. It's really, again, I'm very thankful that I don't have to do this by my hand, that there's actually computers out there and systems that I load the wafer on, I push a button, it runs a program that measures this material, and it analyzes this and it spits out, oh, 50 angstroms or 100 angstroms or 1,000, whatever it is, 1,356 nanometers. You know, it, it knows those films very, very well by, based on this intensity um, interference phenomena that comes out of these tools. And here's an example of, okay, so what's an etch rate, right? So the basics of how etch rates are measured is you, you, you have a, f a wafer with a, with a film of interest on it. Typically it's, it's a wafer with one film. Um, you use the system we just described and you, you measure the thickness of that film. And then you put that wafer into a plasma system for various etch times and you can actually measure, um, so you put that wafer in for say this, this 10 second point right here. And some materials removed, but you don't know how much, right? So you go back to the thin film tool 
and you measure the thickness again. So you've got a pre-etched number, you've got a post-etched number. You now have an amount removed for a 10 second etch. And in this case, somebody actually measured the various amounts removed for these various times and they actually come up with a rate here of the, the amount of uh, the reaction rate or the etch rate, if you will, for this particular material. So, so if you measure the selectivity, as Alok was saying, we, we ask him for various things, various process conditions where you etch one material faster than another material. Or you, you, because in a plasma system, there's reactions happening with everything. Everything reacts. You want to minimize some and maximize others, and you want to maximize the etch rate, or you want to maximize the, the, the speed at which some material is removed, and you want to minimize the, the rate of other materials that are removed. And that's how you build something that looks like this that we showed earlier in the, in the flow, or actually earlier in the talk. And, and how this is created, right? You, you look at this and you say, well, there's all kinds of things going on here. And just to give you an idea, this is a, a gate material. These are, um, we're looking at a transmission electron microscope image here. This is a TEM. Um, you're looking at a SiO2 film, a silicon nitride film, an SiO2 film, a silicon nitride film. How are those created? Well, this is the gate, and these dark lines represent the first material that's, that's deposited here, probably by a plasma system. And actually, it's uniformly deposited on this surface, this surface, this surface, down and over. And then you just expose that to an um, anisotropic etch, which removes the material here, removes the material here with incredible selectivity to this silicon and you leave the material in the sidewall, right? So there's no lithography involved. You've deposited a material, you've etched it anisotropically with a great deal of selectivity to the silicon and you leave sidewalls on the side of it. In a, in a transistor build cycle, the next step after this is you actually put a little implant right here to, to control the, the speed of that transistor, but we're not worried about implant right now, we're etching. So after this sidewall is installed, um, you wanna put more material on the side so that you can actually put another implant out here and control, again, this, the speed of how fast this transistor works. And so there's nitride, we put a very thin layer of SiO2, we put another thin layer of uh, nitride, and then we put another thicker layer of SiO2 on the, on the wafer and etch, it, etch this top SiO2 with selectivity to the nitride. So you form these sidewalls. So you etch, again, anisotropically etch this film, this film. It's removed on the horizontal surfaces. We leave the vertical surfaces and you, you end up with what's called a sidewall of SiO2 on this on this system. And it's etched with enough selectivity that it stops on the nitride. The nitride's removed in a subsequent step. And so on. And each one of these processes that happens, we've gone back and we've set them up to give us a particular etch rate for a particular material with slower etch rates for other materials in the system. All the way down to where you're finally removing the last layers on top of the gate, that you have enough selectivity between the gate and those final layers that the gate is not affected. And just to the next step, okay, so you've, you've measured etch rates, right? and you measured them on multiple films, right? So now you know selectivity between silicon and SiO2 or silicon and silicon nitride. Um, and that's what's being shown here. You, you've done that over varying the different process parameters. So remember we talked about gas flow, power, pressure, temperature. We actually do these 
kinds of characterization things where we vary one of those parameters over a small range of setting and learn what the, what the result is on the wafer. Okay, so we'll do an experiment where we look at three different powers and then we'll back up and we'll do an experiment that looks at three different pressures and we'll learn how that, that parameter changes what happens on the wafer through the, this uh, thin film interference technique to measure the, the etch rate. Um, you combine that for every material on the wafer and all the parameters in the, in the, uh, on the tool and that's what process characterization really means. It's just a number of very simple, very, um, what I think of as mundane experiments done over and over again gives you a very big picture and a very complex picture of what's actually happening in the chamber. So again, we break down a very complex system into the very, very smallest pieces that lets us understand what's going on. So, Craig described you have, you want a very selective process. You want to etch one material and not etch the underlying material. But even though we work to achieve that, it's kind of impossible to <coughs> do that. So, how to know that, uh, you know, on the real wafer or the device wafer, you cannot measure etch rate. You can only do on a blanket wafer. Blanket means there is no device on that wafer. So there comes uh, plasma or process diagnostics. Means in real time, you can know how, when you have etched the material so that you can stop and wafer will come out. So you, that's done by actually very simple optical emission spectrography or spectroscopy. We call it OES. It's like, a, you know, this light has the spectrum. It's not one light, but wavelengths from generally 200 to 800 nanometer. So what we do that we put a small window. So we look through, we don't, but equipment looks through the window and collects the spectra. It looks like this. This is the wavelength. This is the signature. This is the intensity y-axis wavelength. It looks like this in real or, and it keeps on changing because, you know, when the etching starts, you have byproduct coming out of the wafer. When that film is completely removed, you don't have byproduct in the chamber because there's no film, there's no film there to be etched. So, and each species emit a, diff, a different uh, wavelength. Like, you know, in the light, if you put uh, that sodium lamp or something, it has different color. The mercury lamp has a different uh, color. So based on the species, you can have different light or different uh, wavelength. In this case, aluminum etching, which was uh, Craig's uh, aluminum pot. So if he has measured the light, he could have saved his pot. <laughs> so what happened in Craig's case is that after putting that bleach, the byproduct starts to come out and then completely etched till here. And after that, when there is nothing to be etched, your signal drops. So in, in fair, what we do is we look at the signal. Oh, now I see film is starts to etching here. So signal goes up. Flat, so keep on etching. Film is etched, so signal drops down. So we call it endpoint about here. Okay, so if we monitor this, each wafer will be processed same way because uh, the chamber changes, the wafer sometimes changes a little bit. So endpoint, make sure that your etching is very precise. So you don't want to under etch, so film is not etched completely. You don't want to over etch so that underlying layer is damaged, and that's where uh, OES comes. This is widely used in the industry. Everybody uses it. And uh, this is done all automated. We do some manual, but mostly it's automated.
So just to summarize a little bit and to, to tie this all up, we, we kind of we, we've said that there's many, many applications of plasma in, in a, in a cross-section of a, a semiconductor device. Everything from building the gate here, which is, you've got a TEM showing you really high resolution here of, of how you can etch a material and actually stop. This is silicon, this is a polysilicon, this is a gate dielectric or high K material, and you can actually um, stop right on top the, the silicon and, and make a really high performance transistor here. Um, this is a top down of, of what one of these looks like. Um, this material is probably deposited by a, what we call plasma enhanced um, chemical vapor deposition, PECVD uh, deposition. And there's multiple layers. There's a, a darker gray here that's a different material than this material. Um, if these were etched, they would be, if these were formed by etch, um, in this case, I think they're, they're actually CMP, but you can actually etch metals as well and create the, the interconnect through, uh, through metal etch. So there's lots of applications here. There's, um, I don't see an STI, an example of STI here, but if there were, you'd see a, a, a trench in, down in the silicon. So everything from the very beginning all the way to the, 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 the very end, there's, there's etch or plasma involved in in the semiconductor construction. So the, the way to make is again, the, you have to deposit, polish, dig, repeat. <laughs> That's as simple as it can be. Dig, fill, dig, fill, how many times you want to do. So in this, I think this one is very old picture, maybe 20 years earlier, at that time also deposit, etch, fill, polish, deposit, etch. We are still doing the same thing, even though device size has changed so it's much, smaller. but the basics are still the same. And we use more and more advanced tool. So we make computer chip that help us, everybody here, to learn better. Then we make a better tool that can process better chip so that feeds, that's a loop that, you know, for the betterment of device and that spoils kit because they have better Xboxes and uh, Nintendo and everything. <laughs> now this is the, our final slides. So it's, uh, as I said in the beginning, why we're here, to make money and also enjoy what we do. So, and in semiconductor industry, you have, uh, these are the kind of jobs available. One is design, hard, design or hardware engineers. What they do is they make the equipment or design, mechanical design, and, and also the knobs, like you know, what kind of power, RF power, microwave power, it's uh, remote plasma or CCP or all those things. And then process engineers, which we are, is we optimize the knobs, like Craig showed RF power change, selectivity and isotropy, like uniformity we did not discuss. Uniformity means you, know, you want to make chips from that wafer. If edge of the wafer chip is inferior quality than the center of wafer, generally even, you know, anywhere, all the dyes are not same. Some will be bad, some will be good. So the job is to make all the dyes, 500 dyes out of the wafer, all performing equally good. So that, you know, let's say Apple sells a device you got a iPad performing awesome. I have a Apple iPad which is heating up every five minutes. That means, you know, you got from the center of the wafer, I got from the edge of the wafer. So the process engineer job is to make sure your device performance is same as my iPad performance. And then product engineers, then 
we always complain, process engineers always complain, we need more knobs. We want better knobs. So we tell product engineers, actually I'm also a product engineer, so I complain to myself and then I optimize the tool. Again. <laughs> then I say that to you know, give my recommendation to design engineers and then they make the tool. So this is the loop. But uh, these three people are important but not that important. They are okay. The most important people in seven category industry is field service engineer or engineering technicians. Because they run the tool, they sustain the tools, mean they run it trouble free. It's a huge challenge. So they have to run it, sustain it and maintain it. That complex system is by field service engineers or engineering technicians. And uh, just to give a perspective, uh, imagine, let's say my company CEO goes on strike. Maybe nobody will notice, nothing will happen. Then design guys say, I want to go strike, I don't want to work. People will not notice immediately, maybe a year, six months. Process engineers say, I am off for six weeks. I'm going vacation all together. Maybe three months we'll see the, feel the effect. Product engineer, maybe nobody will notice. <laughs> but, <laughs> but imagine if field service honest, engineers honest. or engineering technicians go on all, go on vacation at the same time for four months or even a day. Nothing will move, nothing will happen. Things will collapse. They are the blood, backbone, whatever you can think of, of the semiconductor industry. They are always in demand. We cannot find enough people. We are always looking like, you know, we always look for all these engineers, but field service engineers are the most important. And when I was, I, before joining Tel, I worked a couple of years in Intel. So, I had uh, engineering technicians reporting to me. We used to make same amount of money. <laughs> the engineering techs make same amount of money as process engineer and sometimes higher. If engineering technicians work overtime, they get 1.5 times more money than they generally make. Process engineer, if you work extra, nobody cares. So the, everything works in favor and right now, I think, uh, in CNSE College, in Malta, in Fishkill, and we are hearing that there will be another big company opening up somewhere. So you can imagine the opportunity you have in Albany area or New York area. Not only here, you have Portland, you have Intel, 50,000 people work there. You have Craig's previous company, TI, in Dallas. And uh, in Austin, there are companies. And these are the big ones. There are hundreds of small companies. We discuss RF. Somebody makes those tools. We don't make them. We order from somebody. They make the tools. MFC is made somewhere. MKS is, is in Rochester. They make this equipment. So there's a huge opportunity for us in New York area. And in high demand is service engineers or engineering techs. It just the, each one of those components that we went through, the pump, the MFC, the RF, um, endpoint detector, uh, all of those are subsystems that there, there is someone in this role that can support that and support it seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So typically, these jobs, the, the scheduling of some of these jobs is really, really ideal. I really, really envy some of this, where you work three days a week and you work, you're off four days. Uh, it's just, there should be laws against that, okay? That's too <laughs> good. Um, yeah. And on top of that, the, the reward for, for top performers there is, is substantial. And you wonder, about management, their feeling about that is, is that 
those people that are top performers, they, they really, really look for that, that person that we're gonna describe in just a few minutes. Because then their fab works, their, their wafers flow, they make product. And, in, and that, at the end of the day, that's what matters is um, yielding product out the door. And the folks who can actually make that happen are, are taken care of and, and they, have a, they have a future in this business. And to give a small uh, <coughs> motivation for you guys is that the CEO of Micron, Steve Appleton, he... Uh, not, not even, uh, we'll talk about him. Yeah. <laughs> he, he crashed. The Micron's uh, CEO, of, he died in crash, but yeah. he was a very successful CEO of Micron in Boise. Micron makes a flash, so your computer memory is made by Micron. He was a very young CEO. He started in Micron as engineering technicians. And he rose to CEO level in 15, 17 years. The best manager I ever had, he's now director level in my company. He started as engineering technician. He is my boss. And he knows much more than what all the three types know. Because he has seen the trench work. He has seen what was inside the tool, how everything works. Because nobody has that much visibility to the tool, right? Everybody is on the drawing board or something, but these guys, they see the tool, they know the tool. They are friends with tool. And of course, you know, there's a dream, but what you need to achieve that. So what do you need to succeed in the industry without uh, looking like you're trying? Right? That means you're really enjoying the work. First thing is training. Training means not you know, like uh, just a short span training, but a long-term training. It, learn whatever you can in the class, because that's, where on, that's the only place you can get a, a structured training. But don't be limited to that. Ask uh, industry experts like Craig. Or internet. Internet is the best learning tool we ever had. The video I showed you TSMC, video in the beginning, I just got it from internet, YouTube. We convert it to AVI and show it here. iTunes University, I think everybody, most of people here are iPhone or Android or some sort. iTunes University, or uh, they have courses in electromagnetics, everything from all over the world. You can, and it's like free. You can listen to, watch it whenever you want. And uh, YouTube, there are many lectures. You want to learn about MFC, you just Google mass flow controller or just put in YouTube. You'll get a nice five minute class or introduction on MFCs. So utilize all three, in class, industry people, and internet. And then after your training, if you are there, what you need is problem solving skills. America is a land of problem solvers. We solve problems. That means, you know, we don't want problem to arise and then solve it. We solve it before it happens. That means you understand the system. You look at the system. And we have been saying understand the system as whole, as, as in parts. As you look at the big picture, each component, and how each component interacts with itself. And do not treat the symptom. So, worst doctor, I go to a doctor, I say I have a runny nose. He treats my nose. He didn't treat my flu or maybe bacterial infection. Not a good doctor. So, not a good problem solver, I should say. You should find the root cause. That means you will get to this point only when you have this and this and then this. Let's say I have identified the problem. You have a systematic approach. So, you just don't shoot. Uh, Shots in the dark, but you know, you know this is the issue. Am I solve it by this, this, this? Everything laid out. 
communication is very important. Communication not like uh, you know, talk or uh, lots of words, but what does it mean? It means involve all concerned party. It means you are working in a fab, there's an issue. You inform everybody, you know, engineers, you know, technicians in the subfab. Let's say the MFC issue, you call MKS and tell your MFC has issue. So you get all the parties involved. And also, you know, sometimes you watch some program or news or something. They talk for 45 minutes and you wonder what did they talk? What was the message? What did they discuss? At least you have a problem, a statement. Okay, I got this problem. Have a flow chart of solution, step by step. If this fails, yes, I will go this. No, I will have something else. Then have a success criteria. Means have I achieved something or not? So in, before you get there, you should have a criteria. Success criteria, I want to get A, A in the exam. How to get more than 90 out of 100? Maybe that's the success criteria. And clearly defined. Same thing works in the industry. You have to have problem statement, systematic approach to solution, and success criteria to have success. And these two things are very subjective. I cannot emphasize it enough. Like what you do. If you don't like what you do, you will never succeed. It's very difficult to do something which you don't like and you're like, God, when will be five o'clock or four o'clock? I have to get out of here. You have to like what you do. I know it's easy to say, hard to do, but it's possible. Many people do. You know, Rod Stewart, you might have, somebody asked him why you're so successful. So it's, you know, he said, my profession and hobby is the same. I like what, you, what I do, so I'm successful. We're not the you know, singer or dancers, but you know, same thing can be applied. And last one is, maybe you might be thinking, common sense is, everybody has common sense. That's why it's common. What I mean by common sense is not like, you know, common sense means, in its true form, common sense is being attentive all the time. You're listening, you're communicating, you're connecting dots. If you can connect dots means sometime problem happens in the pump. We start fixing the pump. Then you install new pump, fails again. It turned out something, some particle was in the chamber, something dislodged and hit the fins and damaged the fin. So you have to be mindful of your surroundings, apply your, you know, common sense to everything. You look, you look at something, all these things till here is like, you will do this, 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 you will succeed. But it does not have that common sense part in it, right? You have to have that uh, attention, linking the dots all the time, and then you will succeed. So we've been chat, we've been chatting for quite a while, we've been relating, and I can go on to talk about this. There's there's tons of more, um, and we can get into a lot of detail, or you can broaden it a lot. But do you have any questions for us? We we've thrown a lot of stuff out. Some of it's pretty detailed and pretty high tech. Um, other pieces may not be, but. Do you have questions for us? A anything in the business? Uh, you have a question? Is, does the R&D and the manufacturing go on at the same company? Is it just same company. It's all the same? Yes. Yeah, just to answer that in a little more detail, the, um, there's pre-competitive research and development, and that's where Symmetech's involved. So we work with Intel Global, Samsung, TSMC, yada, yada, all the major companies on things that are going to be built seven years from now. So pre-competitive, what material do you use to build what transistor? Once it gets to the competitive part, companies like Intel, Samsung, Global, 
they're very, very, very protective of what they're doing. IBM, they don't share any of that. So, one example I'll show you that all the pictures you, you, sh you, you have seen, not a single picture is from Tokyo Electron. Because we don't want to show we can't. our proprietary things. It's very, very confidential. Millions and billions ride on single piece of information. But chemistry like bromine, chlorine and the basic things are available for research in public domain. So, and R&D is not only done in companies but also in universities like College of Nanoscience. They have semiconductor research there and they do research. Yes, it's a simple question, we just blow up on it, so. Yeah. I was just curious how long, we were talking, in the very beginning you were talking about Moore's Law, rough guess, how long until, semi or until uh, silicon is no longer a viable vehicle for the process. I know you can't tell me what beyond that, but I mean 10 years, less? So Moore's Law, uh, Moore's Law is not scaling up. So devices, all we showed is planar device, like you know, one get now it's going for 3D devices. Mm -hmm. And people have been saying for the last 10 years that Moore's law is not gonna work and we always invent something or figure out something to continue. Right. So for, right now we're working on 14 nanometer. 22 nanometer is already in production. So you can buy chips made of 22 nanometer Intel chips. Mm -hmm. So in CNSC we're working on 14 nanometer Sematech is working on 10 nanometer, 8 nanometer device. And so 10 years, 12 years, we don't see any, any showstoppers. But just to back up a little bit and what I think about when I have that kind of question come out. Um, 1983, we used a particular kind of exposure tool and that was limited to about a micron and everybody was standing around going, oh, what are we gonna do? Oh my gosh, we, we're, gonna, we're, we're running into a roadblock, there's a brick wall. Well, lo and behold, someone came up with, well, let's change the light source. So we used that light source for a little while. And then, you know, we, here comes another brick wall. Well, we, we get around that a little bit. And, and basically, it's smart guys like you that come along and don't see the same roadblocks that guys like me see, and you say, ah, well, why don't we do this? And you, you know, it's common sense to you because you, you haven't been in this box that we've grown up in. Um, that's one way to think about it is, is these things are there to be solved and you guys are gonna go solve it, you know? So it's, it's there. I don't, you know. Um, are you guys stacking chips now or something? Um, chips are being stacked by lots and lots of you talk about interposers and through silicon via stuff, and yeah. that's been done for, um, uh, companies have been doing that for, for a little while now. And they're actually getting to where they're putting on, in one system, they'll put a microprocessor and two DRAMs on top of it. And so the, the connection time between that microprocessor and, and DRAM between the memory is, you know, it's already that, but, it's even more than that, so yeah, it's stacking. People are doing that and have been for a number of years. I did an internship at CNSC over the summer and oh. they were preparing for uh, midterms. They set up, because they can't go too much smaller, so they said they were stacking them now. Right, right. Trying to use uh, So you take a motherboard and you shrink it down to a system on a chip, that's what that's what the ultimate is, is you actually put everything on one small piece. So. And uh, one comment on your question is that, uh, you know, whenever we hit uh, some kind of roadblock, opportunity, more opportunity is there. So actually, when we see a big problem, it's not a problem, it's a huge opportunity for everybody, for the people who make chips, people who make tools, and everybody else <laughs> involved in that. And once I, actually once I was complaining in my grad school that 
this thing doesn't work and it's so difficult and, and I complained to my advisor that uh, this is too difficult. Then he told me something which I always remember that if there's no problem and two runs, two has no issues, device has no issues, who will need us? Nobody need us. We need things to really get challenging so we can get to the next level. So every time you see some roadblock, you know, feel good about it. Okay. Uh, thank you to these two gentlemen. Thanks for having me.